Hello, this is saxophonist Antonio Parker, and this is a conversation in jazz, where we are promoting jazz through telling the stories. Today, we are presenting part two of our three-part interview with the trumpeter, jazz historian, and author, Mr. Munir Nasser. We ask you to subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so we can let you know when we are posting another video or going live. We also ask you to donate to our Cash App in order to support the channel and help us to produce future videos. Our Cash App is dollar sign Jazzology 101. That's dollar sign Jazzology 101. Thank you. Enjoy the video. We're back talking to Mr. Munir Nasser. This is a conversation in jazz. Okay, Munir, you have re you recently authored a book, we said, called Upright Bass, The Musical Life and Legacy of Jamil Nasser, a jazz memoir. What's a memoir? Well, memoir is uh, a person reflecting on particular areas of their life. Okay. As opposed to, a, I didn't want to commit myself to an a autobiography because I knew at a certain point I would have to complete this journey on my own. Okay. See, what happened, my father was in a period of unemployment. He was frustrated. Mm -hmm. And also, what we didn't realize at that time, it was the early stages of Alzheimer's. <clears throat> wow. So I got a distress call from my stepmother. Can you drop everything right now and come? Your father's not acting right. I don't know what's wrong. Mm. What should we do? I said, well, we need to find something constructive for him to do. He's done playing. He's documented mm -hmm. on many recordings, mm -hmm. many live performances. It's time for him to write his memoirs. It's something he always wanted to do. And so we agreed. And so I started going up. But before I put pen to paper, I sat in front of my father, just like I'm sitting with you. Mm -hmm. I said, are you doing this <clears throat> because your wife wants you to do it? Or do you really think this is important? He said, no, 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 I want to do that. I think this is important. That's all I need to hear. Wow. And, and we different. started from there. And you also have a CD, Munir Nasser, A Soldier Story. That's your first CD? Yes. Okay, what's the concept behind A Soldier well, Story? Well, this is the musical companion to the book. Okay, This great. is my musical tribute. All right. And in fact, I included a, a song that was written, uh, I, b I believe it was written the year I was born. It was definitely released the year I was born. Okay. Tropical Breeze. Okay, so do you have... Are you writing, is there original compositions? Yes, uh, I wrote Soldier Stories in an original okay, composition. Okay, okay. And I have um, two others. On okay. There. Did you, your father, did he, did, did he pin any, anything on this? Yes, or, or Tropical he, Breeze. Okay, great, great. Yes. Okay. So. Um, That's on the album Nature Boy. That was actually released the year I was born. Wow. Yeah, within a couple of days of me being Man, you, you, your ability to remember dates and <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 I mean, it's like, that, I mean, that's, yeah, I always been fascinated yeah. with dates. Yeah. <laughs> it's you like, know. wow. Not only that, man, it's fascinating that you know when I can go to you, when does such and such die? When, you know, when is, you know, <laughs> you're like a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> I want you to know that. Wow. But anyway, let's, let's move forward. So, we're not going to go in depth okay. into the book because we want people to purchase the book. Yes. And get some of these stories uh, that way. Okay. okay. But I do want to know. We should give us a general synopsis of what Upright Bass is about, and again, elaborate on why you wrote the book. Okay. First of all, this represents, and I always say, it, a preemptive strike. We knew from the way the media dealt with my father during the course of his career that they weren't going to note his passing which Jazz Time and Dime Beat did not even acknowledge wow. that this man left the earth. Mm. Now, and I said it at the book launch a couple of years ago in New York, Jimmy Owens grandfathered an article into the Jazz Times. So it didn't come from the Jazz Times. Now, he used to go to the Jazz Times conference and challenge them. Your father? Yes. There's people. Whitmore John told me about it the first time he was wow. there. Wow. And there's other people that remember that. So I sent them, I gave them two copies. Mm -hmm. I gave one to Lee Mergner, and I went. He was the editor, um, the chief editor, and then I gave another one to the person that replaced him mm -hmm. in New York. Two mm -hmm. copies, mm -hmm. no review. They only reviewed two books. Wow. And let me say this: every jazz book is rare. These mm. books are not coming out by the truckload. And you how many African Americans, especially from our generation, 
are writing books, hardly none. Wow. A lot of them are writing articles and stuff, but hardly none. Because this is a long, this took me 15 years to do. This is much easier hold to write on. an article hold on, hold on, hold on. in a magazine or a PR article than to write a book. So when you started out, did you know it would take 15 years? I had no idea. We're going to get into that. I thought maybe for <laughs> three, four years, five years tops, and I'd be out of there. Wow. I had no idea it was going to take 15 And it's 15 a testament, years. man, to perseverance. And, I, you know, a lot of times, man, you know, we as African-American men don't yes. get a lot of uh, props for some of the things we got to overcome just to exist and to, and to go beyond existing into producing products and and and, and thing a lot of times we don't get the res the uh no uh, the uh attention and respect do you feel that yes i mean two of the biggest enemies of this project were two of the his clo the closest people in the world to him that he sold to me i don't know i mean i know them to a certain ex extent but these were people that were close to him, that he vouched for him and said these were the good spiritual people. They were two of the main opposers, and we're going to get into who they are later, Ooh. of this particular <laughs> this project. Gonna get good. You understand <laughs> yeah, what I'm wow, saying? Wow. And I have to put it on the record, you know. Wow. Um, there was a time I would be more strategic and, and, and try to kind of just play it off. Yeah. But there's too many lessons involved in this for me just to let it slide. Well, so we're gonna we're let's, gonna let's go, go let's let's get into it. it. Let's go there because the next question is, what were some of the challenges that you had to overcome, overcome and endure in writing upright? Okay, Best? first thing, my father saved everything. I'm okay. gonna give you one quick example I brought into the studio. This right here is an airline ticket from 1960. Okay, from Russia to Cairo. You'll read it in a book that they played in Russia. And um, they, wa they wanted them to defect there and become Russian citizens, and they declined. And so the, the Russian ambassador, I'll send you anywhere in the world you want to go, and he sent them to Cairo. This is the original ticket from 1960 in my hand. Wow. He saved that, and he saved a lot of other stuff. And so after he died, I called my stepmother to get his material, you know, pictures and all kind of stuff, and she refused to let me have To this day, she has refused to give me access. To that material, did she but there's a any, lot of. She, she gave, gave me a little corner of stuff. You know what I'm saying? And why? She gave me a and why? And why do you think? Why do you think that was? But, you she know. said, "Well, she, what she told me, I ain't, she, her, her answer was, I ain't trying to go there.' I said, "Well, you don't have to go there. Give my brother Naji the key. I'll copy, scan, whatever, and I won't touch the original stuff." But why? You're doing something to honor your father. This is his wife now. This, this yeah. is the one. This is the one that loved him and slept near him. You know, on the, next to him for 25 years, and always used to complain when they wrote and left him out of different reviews and didn't give him credit for things he did with the foundation and other things. I I remember many years hearing to say, "Your father did this," and they don't recognize your father. Then it came to writing the book. She's gonna withhold all this information for what? So it's sitting in storage, going to waste. And a lot of time we blame white. How did that make you we feel? We blame white folks. We blame everybody else for suppressing our history, but there's some people in our ranks that are anti-development. They don't want to see you do nothing, you see? Mm. And they will, they will put stumbling blocks in your way. My mm. father asked me to do that. She knows that. She's the one that really initiated this. It was her call, her distress call to me. Mm. I was minding my business. Come help your father, which I did. Wow. So when she called for me, I dropped everything, whether it was to move them from place to place. And then when it came time, for me, for her to deliver something to me that I needed, it was like... Uh, and, it, and how did that make you feel? I mean, how did, I I was, mean, I'm still pissed off about it. I'm still very angry about it. Because that stuff is going to waste. There's a lot of rare stuff in there. Interviews with Papa Joe, some stuff that he... Information he promised to give my father for years. Wow. You know what I'm saying? That's just sitting there. Um, Sam Jones' last recording, the master to that. Wow. I could go on and on. Letters, wow. tapes. I mean, it's a treasure trove of information in there that, that's sitting going to waste. The Memphis and May Festival, I just happened to get that. Um, and when I took it to a person that transferred from that big three-quarter tape, remember the big videotapes? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He transferred that to He said, man, it's a good thing you got it here because that thing is degrading at an exponential rate. And he said, if you hadn't brought that to me today, I probably couldn't have done it. Wow. And so I was able to get the finale for the Memphis and May Festival. So why did it take 15 years? It's because I, okay, you getting, if, I, and I'm just, I know why, mm -hmm. but just for the, for the audience, share with us 
what some what some of the challenges? I mean, I mean, you got you, you got to talk to you got BB King's yes. words in the book. Um, uh, 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 did the introduction uh Ron Carter. Ron Carter. I'm getting old. Shout out to Ron <laughs> Carter. Because Ron Carter give basically we, give Ron I gotta Carter give Ron Carter some love because here's this man just basically just wrote a blank check with his name on it. Wow. And trusted me, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. To 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 write a book that wouldn't embarrass him and wouldn't make him look bad. I mean, that's an example of an elder, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. helping the young man to do something. He knew he knew my father, you know, in fact, my father sent him on a sub. Uh, for him to to play with Zay at Wells, really? so I did get to play with Ron Carter one time wow. on one song. Zay let me That's sit in, great. and so I'm playing. We playing rhythm check. I feel his big hand in back of my back, uh-huh. and I was moving too close to his base, <laughs> and he like pushed me forward. But That's thank you, Mr. Carter. I really appreciate what you did for me wow. in writing this intro. And, and, and how many say how many interviews did you do? Like, do you know? Do you remember? Uh, okay. Approximately fifty. Wow. And see, like, take for I was not going to complete this book without Monte Alexander. Monte Alexander was a great friend of my father. You know, he used to yeah. always call. Mm-hmm. Monte would just show up. I remember being with my father, and he just showed up and mm. hey, what you doing tonight? Mm. Oh, I got a gig for you. And he was on that very festival, this festival. Monte Alexander. He showed one. up at the door in 1984. And my father said, What you doing tonight? I'm nothing. He said, I got a gig for you. Wow. And he was on the gig just like that. 15. And he's a nice guy. And we said, but to give you an example, I took 15 years. I, I had to wait two years to get an interview with him. I can't finish that book without him. He's too important mm-hmm. to my father's history to leave him out. So mm-hmm. I had to wait till he was available. Floyd Newman, who played with him at B.B. King's band, mm-hmm. he was ailing. He was going through. It took me six months to get to him. Now, how'd you get to, I don't know if you want people, how'd you get to talk to B.B. King? Well, B.B. King, the funny thing is, um, we waited for him outside of the Howard Theater. Because Polly Walker, his, um, Manager, uh-huh. one of his managers, she said, um, I'm going to give you the name of a lady named Tina France. She said, uh-huh. if you get to Tina France, you get to BB. That's the direct link. Wow. So we were waiting outside the Howard Theater. Cold. I mean, it was freezing out there. And his bus is sitting right there. And I'm sure we were looking odd. I had the album with him and my father's pitch on it, you know. And so we waited for him to come out. And as he was going in, you know what I'm saying? Wow. I was able to meet him, talk to him. And he said, um, yeah, uh, Tina told me about the interview. Just, you know, facts are the questions, and I'll answer them. Wow. You know, and and he, he he got back to me. Okay. And that took 10 years from the time I talked to Fina. And rest in peace, Tina French. Not Tina French. She's still alive. But Polly Walker, wow. is, she passed away. She said, make sure I get a copy of that book when it's done. And wow. she passed away. But she told me. And it's funny. As, as we were standing outside, I, I said, somebody said, Did anybody seen Tina? And I said, that would be Tina France, is it? I said, yeah. <laughs> Tina, I said, all I got to do is find Tina France. And I wow. cornered her. I told her what I was doing. And she set it up. Thank you, Tina France, for that, too. Wow. She set up beautiful, the whole interview. Beautiful. Now, you, you know we got to go there, right? Yes. You know where we're going? Yes. <laughs> now, I, let me say this. Before okay. you even go on, make no mistake about it. B.B. King is the most popular musician, bar none, that my father ever played with. Okay. If I went to high school and said my father played with B.B. King, the janitors, the teachers, the students, everyone would have known who B.B. King was. Yeah. And that's who he started his career with okay. in 1955. B.B. Okay. B. King's first band. Not the B.B. King everybody knows now. Mm-hmm. The B.B. King just trying to make a name for himself. Mm. He wasn't even that popular then. Wow. He was at the ground floor of his career. This was his first band in 1955. Wow. So you know, you and I, we talk. Yes. Through this process. 15 year process. Yes. We talk. I've I've been on the other end of the line. Yes. Heard your rants. Heard your frustration and, and your anger and disappointment. And yes. You mentioned your uh stepmom. Yes. Okay. This is the first time we're gonna talk about one of the great pianists that your dad performed with, right. Mr. Ahmed Jamal. Yes. Take it away. What happened? Cause if you want to share, no, this is a this is a musician I always respected his ability. Yeah, because you told us to play piano. I, when we had Howard, you all, we would go see. Howard, oh yeah, and that was would, mandatory. Yeah. So if you want to share some, of and if you notice, I would pull y'all along. Yeah, it was like I said, y'all got to see this man play mm-hmm. because for some reason y'all weren't even really into him. Yeah, and so one by one, I was saying, man, y'all need to check this cat yeah. out. Yeah. I mean, Miles listened to him and built a whole formula. You mm-hmm. know, the formula of success okay. is attributed to some of the stuff he got from Jamal. Mm-hmm. And your father's on some of his most famous 
albums, right? Yes. Wow, okay. So I'm sure you reached out to Ahmed Jamal to get him. But I'm gonna tell him like I I'm gonna tell you like I told him. It wasn't because of my father that I did that. He didn't send me to him. In fact, he may not even know this unless he hears this. I was there when he called. We were in, he, my father told him that we were doing this book. Wow. Ooh. Yes, I was sitting right there when he answered the phone. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and so I, um, about 2009, I took him basically what's in the book. I said, this is what I want to write. And he said, well, you know, we have to discuss it first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I was patient. Um, I waited. But at a certain point, I had to put the period on the sentence to get this thing complete, you know. And so first it was like, do nothing, you know, until I get back to you. Don't put it out like this. Do nothing until to, you hear from me. Do nothing you hear from me. And finally, I had to say, look, either, you know, you're going to contribute or not. And, um, you know, he wrote me some emails. This is all in the email chain. And um, the emails are kind of, frankly, quite hostile. And so all he had to say was no. If you didn't know, he gave me his email. He gave me his, his home phone, his cell phone. Mm. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. He gave me. And so why would you give me three of your numbers, all this contact information, say you're going to participate, and then when it's time, and I was patient. I wasn't bothering him. Mm -hmm. You know, you could check his phone records. There ain't no and call why do you from, think? And why do, there's no call and dad, from William Nassau on his. Your dad spoke highly yes. of Ahmed to you. Yes. Right? So, what do I you don't know. I mean, like I said, I, I, uh, I mean, I can. I, I, he, he, he commandeered me, or uh, assigned me the task of reading this letter. You want to share it? It says, uh, "The gift of mutual friendship and trust between Jamil and I will take volumes to put in words." Well, I put some of them in here. Ooh. Maybe you'll decide to put them in volumes <laughs> later, but you know, some is this is, this not is your volumes. father's right. This, this is Ahmed Jamal directly. Oh, this in I'm, short, okay. he and I have explored many avenues together, musically, philosophically, philosophically, family wise, business wise, and on and on. His transition to the real world from this one of illusion leaves a vacuum in my life and in the lives of many, and a wake up call that one day I must follow him in this graduation process. We shared stories ranging from Oscar Denied, which is in here, mm -hmm. Phineas Newborn, in here, mm -hmm. his work with B.B. King, in here, his work with me as a bassist and vice president of our record company and our families growing up together. Wow. Most importantly, our spiritual development and pursuits took us all over the world from Cairo, Egypt to Suriname. That wow. story's in here. That's when I was born. All over the U USA together with Mr. Frank Gant, Mm. who shared many, many experiences with us during the 10 years. That's, that's a 10? Not ten two, years. not three, <laughs> not four. During the 10 years we were working together. A man for all seasons. He raised money for musicians who fell ill. He campaigned on my behalf and others and remained loyal to our friendship from the very beginning and has left a grand legacy and will be thought about and prayed for by his friends and family members throughout their lives. I'm a Jamal. Now, if you, I read this at his memorial on May 21st, wow, uh, 2010. Wow. Ahmed had flew in from from Italy five hours early mm -hmm. and said, "Well, if if I show up, if I show up, read it. If I don't show up, read." I read his letter wow. to those who were gathered because he asked me to. Mm. And so when I asked him. For his participation in this, he didn't contribute one word to this book. And in fact, he did an interview three years ago, and they asked him about basis. He didn't even mention my father. Go look at the Downbeat 2017 interview where Eugene Holly asked him about the basis of his group, and he forgot about that 10 years Jamil Nasser was wow. with them. That's so I don't know is, what is that's that about. Personal? And here's a man that always talks about people need to make the most of themselves, and people need to like build and... And um, you know, developed himself. Now, how did that know? how did that affect your relationship with Ahmed? Oh, there is no relationship. Oh wow. <laughs> I mean, but there's nothing to talk about. I tried to call him after he sent me that poison pen letter, talking about <laughs> he got me in the blues alley for free, <laughs> and I showed up there unannounced. You know what I'm saying? That's not your house, dude. It's a club. A lot of people show up there unannounced. 
Wow. So he was more p concerned with protecting the master's blues alley, the slave master's <laughs> house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and helping me complete my father's book, a cat that yeah, but, helped him to, you know, to develop his music. And it's ob it's obvious just from talking to you that as, that is that that hurts you. It affects you. No, but I'm saying, I mean, well, disappointed. I mean, you you heard the letter? Yeah. Where's yeah. the brotherhood? Where's the family? What's all? Why'd you have me lead that letter? And then when it comes time to contribute to this, you don't have a word to say. Yeah. I mean, I can understand, man. And the Christians, the people that's supposed to be on a low level spiritually, uh -huh. they helped. Yeah. Ron yeah. Carter ain't no Muslim. Wow. You see what I'm saying? Wow. So he didn't contribute one word to this book. He's not in the knowledge. And I never thought that would have happened. I thought, he's had, thought he had a healthy respect and love for my father. Wow. You know? I'm, and I'm glad you have, you're taking this opportunity to share that with I mean, book. he didn't want to write his memoirs. That's his business. But you can't tell me not to write my father's book. It's not about who, he's, who he is. It's about who he's not. He's not my father. Dead, alive, or in between, you know what I'm saying? You can't give me marching orders to do nothing. And that's what that demonstrated. I told him, and I wrote him a letter, I'm going to write what my father told me without your participation or not. And that's what you have to do. Get it done. And, Same. you know, it was my mistake. You know, one time I had that cat on a pedestal. I respected him and stuff like that. And I know what he's done for other people mm -hmm. that are not of our color. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so okay. I, I know about that, too, because they told me about spending nights over there and wow. hanging out. I didn't want none of that. I just wanted him to contribute something. Yeah. I never tried to hang out with him. Yeah. I never tried to be his friend. It wasn't about that. Yeah. You know? That'd be like if your son asked me to, you know, you know, to write something you know, on his dad, you know, I, I know you. But I'm just saying, come on, I mean... He, I mean, my father came to New York with Phineas Newborn. Wow. Yeah. Now, most of the questions that people ask about the book are not about Ahmed Jamal in that period. They ask about Phineas Newborn, Oscar Denied, wow. John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. That's the, in terms of the questions I've received about the book, I've received less questions about that period than any other period. Okay. Wow. I mean, that's not, he's not the only, you know, great musician my father played with, you know. All right. So let's let's move on. <laughs> I know you. Be, I know you're very passionate about. No, but I'm just saying. I mean, I don't care. I mean, I was gonna yeah. get it done anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You, and I you mean, did, man. And and, and salute. Because he's talking about don't put it out until I get back. I'm like, man, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we didn't start this with with yeah, him. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna commandeer our project. You know. Yeah, man. And 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 really, man. And we're gonna talk about that later when we get to another section. But a lot about passing a torch and and. And and that sort of thing. So we're gonna talk about that. No, but I want to say another thing. If the if the if it was the opposite situation, and his daughter Samaya came to my father, he, he would have got she would have got everything she needed. Yeah. Wow. You see what I'm saying? He yeah. would have. That's the kind of cat he was. He would sit down and talk to you. Yeah. That service component is real, man. And you and you can get that just reading that book. Your book. You can tell that. about we're gonna talk about that. Um. But let's move on. Yes. Be um. Your father passed. In the process of you writing this book, right? Well, well, he he, he was degenerating until that the Alzheimer's. But know. he 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 actually he 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 died before you completed. The oh book. yes, yes. How'd you how how did you deal with that? How'd you cope with that? And no, it was you, see what it is when you deal with Islam, man. You know when you die, they bury you in twenty four hours. Mm -hmm. And me and him casually talked about when he to put my ass in a box. And put me in the ground and keep it moving. But you still was affected because you, oh, yeah. you tell me about you tell me about you. It's nothing that you could ever plan. And you I yeah, mean, but what it is, we're not just our bodies. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. If you had a car and it died, uh -huh. and you had to take that car and put it in the junkyard, you just get another car. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the vehicle changes, but you're still the driver. And so we have mind, body, and spirit. But a lot of times, people just deal with the body. Even people that are so-called spiritual and religious. Death, you know what I'm saying, is a spiritual event because you're transitioning into that in, into that world. So, so in t in terms, we all mourn, we lose loved ones. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you had to go through a mourning and grieving process, but you had to continue. Right, but this is about okay. We all have to die, but and then they call your body your remains. No, but you have a he had my father left a body of work. Mm, heavy. See what I'm saying? Yes, so this is the resurrection. Because he may be dead physically, uh -huh. but he's been resurrected in, in the literary world of jazz. And there's people alive, including the person we just mentioned, they don't have a book on the shelf about their career. Mm -hmm. As great as they may think they are, and as better 
you know, they may think they're better than this cat <laughs> and more important. But mm -hmm. my question is, where's your book? Exactly. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of ego stuff, man. Yeah. And like yeah. jazz, I don't see somebody playing a jazz. Even the biggest star in jazz, which would probably <laughs> be Whitney Marcellus, uh -huh. a lot of people don't know who he is, man. Yeah, no doubt. So I mean, to see a jazz cat tripping, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't go to my school and say, well, my father played with Ahmed Jamal. They didn't know who he was. Yeah. None of the teachers, nobody. <laughs> nobody was playing that music. So I mean, just to, for somebody to come like that, an ego trip, man, I just don't get it, man. Gotcha. So, uh... In this pro and we're talking about the process of you writing this book. You've had to learn how to edit. You had to uh, do a bibliography. You had to teach. You had to. So how, how you were doing all and writing the book at the same time? You know, I always kind of flirted with writing. Even at Howard, I wrote a couple of articles for the Hilltop. You oh, know, really? I didn't. Okay, some flagship yeah. articles. One time yeah. I had an article doing one of the home kind of thing, 1989. I still have copies uh -huh. of it. And I always did like writing on my own and stuff uh -huh. like that. And then I was around just a lot of. And this, Just like Howard, my national government professor was Nat, Michael Parente. Mm. He's, one of the, he's one of the most brilliant <clears throat> political scientists in the world today. Wow. You know, he has left his leanings, but our textbook was Democracy for the Few. Mm -hmm. So I remember being around people like that. He had his books out. He was giving lectures. I was working with Ethel Burt Miller mm -hmm. up in the African American Resource Center. He was always editing somebody. He was writing books. He was giving lectures. So I was around people playing the music, but I was also around a lot of intellectuals, writers, and scholars. And I aspired, I had aspirations in that direction as well as musical aspirations. Okay. So 15 years in. Your writing, editing, uh, presenting your uh, editors, you know, all the things that go into uh, 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 writing a book. How do you know when you were done? How'd, we, we, okay, this is it. You put the period on it, we're done. That's a good question. I, and, and, I, and I indicated in the, um, in the introduction, which I called the overture, that I had to excavate like about 40 years of just conversations in the car, you know, stuff that we talked about. Mm. And at a certain point, I didn't have any more. Nothing came to my mind. Oh, wow. That's you know like, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, it was like it was over. I didn't have, there was nothing, you know, that came into my mind that I needed to write about. And that's when I knew that I pretty much had the story. Okay. You know, as much of it as, as I was going to get in between those, those covers. So in addition to being an author... You're also a publisher. You start your own publishing company. Yes, Let's Vertical Visions it. Media Group. Okay. So what what was the what was the intent of starting your own publishing company? I know, but for the for the for the audience, why'd you decide well, to self-publish? The mainstream publishers have this thing about jazz books not being, you know, viable mm -hmm. in terms of the market. Mm -hmm. And so and then they want to control the narrative. When you sign with a major publisher, it becomes their book. They determine the title. They would have been the Upright bass, <laughs> the musical life and legacy of George Joyner with Jamil Nasser in parentheses. And once I sign the dotted line for that mega advance, $5,000 or $10,000, it becomes their book. So okay. what they say stays in, <laughs> stays gotcha. in, and what they say comes out, comes out. And I didn't want to see that kind of control, uh -huh. you know, to the very uh, press establishment that kind of opposed my father and ignored him. Why should I put the ball in their court now when they pretty much ignored him most of his career? That would be... You know, and then there's some controversial content in there that I know that they would have edited out. Gotcha. So, okay. And didn't we fight for freedom? Wasn't about the six, everybody was asking for freedom. Exactly. And some of those people, I don't understand it. They'll sit here, the older people say, well, we marched with Dr. King and we were with Malcolm <laughs> X. Why don't you take your book to a publisher? Didn't y'all fight for freedom? Why are we going to take something like this? The very people that edited us out and ignored us and destroyed our history, we supposed to go back and get authentic history from them? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's. I thought we. You, they said we were shortchanged. That we didn't get it. But apparently, a lot of them. And these are older people. These were people that shook Malcolm X's hand and went to the yeah. lecture. So why are you asking me? Why, you know, why am I going to the mainstream publishers to get my And then my we book have the done? we have the benefit of of social media. We have the internet, which maybe they didn't have. With no, but understand this: social. When I started this book. Self-publishing was stigmatized. I watched it grow year by year oh, wow. uh -huh. into the level of legitimacy that it enjoys. Now, I got a Publisher's Weekly review. There was a time Publisher's Weekly wouldn't touch yourself. I want to, I want to talk about books. that. Like, okay, how, what was the feeling like today? Like, I'm going to share this. Oh, I, I remember because I did, I did a yes. share of books, the uh, Language of Jazz, 
uh, and I, and I remember just the feeling and excitement of ready to push sin. Now let me. I'm glad you went to that, and because I got to tell the audience about you in that in regard to that book. Now Antonio was calling me every day. Man, how the book going? Where you at? I mean, every day. You know, when is it gonna be finished? Uh -huh. Where you at now? What you doing now? And then one day during the course of our conversation, he said, "You know what? I'm gonna write a book on jazz." This cat literally hung up the phone, and the next time, <laughs> the next time I checked on him, the book was finished, out and ready for publication. It, it, no, it was, it was, a, it you know was. What I'm saying there was a lot of work in between. Yeah, but, but that, was still, yeah. That, that was four years. was my, my that was four years later afterwards. And it was like pretty much but every I started, day. Yeah, I started. I remember as soon that. as we got off that phone. Yeah, that was I amazing. Started, I started because I because I was asked. I said, man, why? Why don't we like? I always wonder, like, why do George Coleman or Freddie Hubbard? Why don't they write their own books on how that concept and right. and that sort of thing? You know, I mean, and and make money, um, uh, 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 passive income, um, you know, you based on their knowledge. And I'm like, I never understood that. Why? But you know, and I remember interviews, particularly with George and some of Woody Show, where they talked about that. That people who said, "Why don't you write a book?" And I remember George talking about that, you know, the patterns for jazz improvisation. Uh huh. The one Oliver Nelson is that what it's called? Okay. He said it was pretty good, but there's some other stuff that he saw that could have really, you know, um, brought home the ideas he was trying to get across in that book, and that he was considering doing. Yeah, but so why don't you know? We got a lot of jazz masters, you know, and I, why don't why don't they, in terms of self publishing, you know, maybe. You know, in this time, at least in this day and time, right, right. You know, I mean, with with the internet, with the, you know, social media, and I, I just don't understand it. You know, we just want to play. We want to be on stage playing our instruments. Um, but you then, know, Rufus and, Reed did it. Rufus Reed, it, when he came to the uh, book line, he was one of my father's students. I put the story in the book too about how they met. Okay. Because like, just for instance, him and his wife. Came to Reuben Brown's, mm -hmm. uh, not, it wasn't a memorial, but he had just had the stroke. Remember, mm -hmm, they were raising mm -hmm, funds. Mm -hmm. And his wife just came and said, Oh my God, I remember when we was in Seattle and your father was teaching uh, wow. Ruben, uh, uh, Rufus how to play and da da da. Wow. And I stored that away from 95 until I wrote this book. Wow. And so I actually, you know, I don't even think I had to interview Ruf, Rufus to get that because they, I had the whole story in my head wow. from 95 that they told me. But my father did tell me that he had taught Rufus Reed, but he wrote, I think um, a, a book on baseline, uh -huh. evolving baselines or something to that effect. And he said, the first thing Alan Dawson told, he said, if you write the book, make sure you own it, wow. that you own the rights. Wow. And so Ron and, and, Carter and, had done that and a couple of people, but it, I have to agree with you, it, it should have been a lot more commonplace. And I want to ask you, what's your thoughts on the importance of African Americans telling their own stories and owning their creations through self publishing And we, t we briefly talked about why, why is that important? That we tell because you know, because there's a lot of stories that's not told, right? But that they're taken to the grave oh and that are not told. So, so just briefly, because I want to get to this next section. So, well, like you have a speaking voice. I have a speaking voice now, right? Uh -huh. My father had a voice, mm -hmm. and so it's not just us telling our story. It's telling our story in our voice. Mm. A lot of time, what editors do on Fifth Avenue in New York, they put our history in their voice. Ooh. And so you'll be reading books on jazz musicians mm -hmm. written by a scholar at the University of Iowa. There's only one problem. Jazz musicians don't talk like that. They don't use that kind of language. Yeah, yeah. And you wouldn't know because you don't hang out with them. You don't have nothing to do wow. with jazz culture, jazz history. You haven't spent enough time with the musicians to know how they speak and how they express themselves. And you, and you read the book and they're really stiff academic tomes wow. that don't reflect the dynamism and the excitement of the music they're talking about. Why should the writers be exempt? You know, the musicians expect to get on stage and kill and blow the house down, mm -hmm. but you can get to write a boring, uninspired book, mm -hmm. and people and nobody gets to critique it. Wow. But if you get up there and miss one note, they're ready to say you can't play or I can't <laughs> play. Or, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the writing, a lot of the writing is is corny, man, and, and stiff. And you and how how's your book been received? Your, um, not as well as I would like. You know, like but I said, you, did, you said you uh, week uh, publishes weekly. Yeah, published week, published weekly. What it, they had a contest, mm -hmm. and so I submitted this book to a contest. And they vetted, you know, and that's why it's important. You, accuracy is a must. 
I mean, I still had to correct just a couple of things, you know, because I went through every word and sentence of this book, and I still missed a couple of things. And what's the significance of being on, getting on publishing? Because that's the that's basically the holy grail of the book publishing industry. I mean, that's libraries and everybody, a lot of and you, as institutions that buy books, wow. they consult publishers weekly as wow. to the books they should buy. That's a major accomplishment if you ask me. Yeah, and it would have cost seven fifty. I didn't have to pay. And then even if you pay seven fifty, they don't guarantee you a good review. You have to earn a good review. Wow. And then it was a finalist in the non-fiction contest. Wow. I made it to the top 40, and I don't know how many out of how many books. I would imagine at least 1,000 books. Wow. At beautiful, the very man. least, we're competing for that. That's beautiful. But also, they, they tend to um, expect self-published books to be faulty in terms of grammar, in terms of structure, and stuff like that. That's why self-publishing got a bad name, because editing is crucial, man. Because the editor, what I learned is the writer, you write for yourself. The editor thinks about the end user, which is the reader. Okay. See what I'm saying? Some of the stuff you may want to write about may not be of interest to the reader, but interest to you. So the editor <laughs> is like a buffer between the writer and the reader. Okay. So your message gets across clearly. Final question. How can the people get Upright Bass, the musical life and legacy of Mr. Javel Nasser? And Munir Nasser, a soldier story. How can they get okay. it? Okay. Um, one of two ways. You could. I would prefer you to order it from our website. It's mm -hmm. www.jamilsnasser.com. You can order both the CD and the book from that website. I have munirnassermusic.com. That's also my website where you get the CD. But we're selling them on both. So you could come to www.jamilsnasser.com. Okay, on that note, we're going to take a break and get to our next se section, section. And I'm Antonio Parker with Munir Nasser, and this is a conversation in jazz. <laughs> 